It might surprise you that 60% of the work we do at the Mayo Clinic is with Medicare patients. So about 53% of our patients are Medicare, but because they require and deserve more care, it's about 60% of our book of business. And there's a, there's a rumor out there that Mayo Clinic doesn't see Medicare patients, but we are probably the largest integrated group practice of Medicare in the country. We support education and research. We're a not-for-profit, and what profits we make get uh, reinvested in education and research, and as I mentioned, the tune of that is about $400 million a year, and we, we need to do that, and we want to do that to be at the cutting edge. We're facing significant downward pressure on our reimbursement, as you are in the state of Massachusetts, and we are across the country. We've tried to estimate what the Affordable Care Act uh, will mean for our reimbursement, and conservatively, it's probably 15 to 25 percent less reimbursement than we're currently getting for everything we do. And when I say that to our physicians, they kind of say, is that a big deal? <laughs> 15 to 20 percent reduced reimbursement for the work that we do is a big deal. In Medicare, our Medicare patients who we love seeing, we do great work in people who are about my age and a little bit older. Our physicians love seeing these patients. They have multiple complex chronic diseases, as we all know, but we struggle to afford it. Medicare pays about 58 cents on the dollar for our care, and so we lose about a billion dollars a year for the 60% of patients that we see currently, and that's before Medicare begins to reduce its payments. So the headwinds are very strong for us as they are for you. Mayo's in a very strong financial position with our brand and our success over the years and our culture, but we're not immune to these changes. So we are relevant. We're in the same boat you are trying to figure out how do we do this for our patients? How do we provide outstanding quality at lower cost? So I want to talk about two key components that we are addressing, that we feel and we're addressing. It's the issue of fragmentation of care and uneven quality. I'll start with a patient from my practice that illustrates something that you live every single day. Annie's a 47-year-old woman from the southeast part of the country who came to see me in my practice of multiple sclerosis, having been to many centers in the southeastern part of the country. Over the preceding four years, she'd been told she had a progressive form of multiple sclerosis, and she'd gone from being well to being unable to walk more than 100 feet with a cane. <coughs> she'd had five MRI scans of the brain, two of the spinal cord, a lumbar puncture, and five hospital admissions lasting at least five days each for cortisone steroid treatment, corticosteroid treatment. She was now on long-term alternate day steroids. She had osteoporosis. She had peptic ulcer disease, thin skin, hypertension, and was told that she needed to go on chemotherapy for the treatment of her progressive multiple sclerosis. The kind of case that we see all the time, and if there are other neurologists in the, in the room, they're familiar with this. As I took her history, I didn't think she had MS for a number of reasons. I spent about 80 minutes with her, and I did have the time to do that because of the nature of our practice, and I reviewed all of her outside records, and there was nothing convincing in her laboratory data or in her examination. Importantly, if you have progressive MS and you're essentially almost wheelchair dependent, you shouldn't have a normal neurological examination. So it was pretty clear that Annie had a functional disorder. She had non-organic neurological disease, but our system was killing her with the treatment. So I had a chat with her and her husband about what needed to happen. We needed to gradually withdraw her medication, put her in a rehabilitation program. And this was not an easy conversation to have, as you can understand. We gradually worked through that with rehab. She was in rehab three days a week for several weeks as an outpatient. We got her off her medication. I saw her every six months for the next three years, and then annually until last year, 
Nine years later, she's neurologically normal. She's made a full recovery, and that's a thing of the past. We tried to understand the costs of this fragmented, uneven quality care that Annie had suffered from at top, top hospitals in this country. We said, well, let's start with what the cost of the Mayo Clinic over nine years was, and we gave that an X, whatever that was. Then we looked back at the cost of her care in the four years before I'd seen her, and it was estimated to be between 14 and 30 times that. So Annie fell through the cracks in the American medical system with the wrong diagnosis and spiraled out of control on that basis. And that happens every day in this country. And you all have your own stories. Perhaps you or family members have suffered from that. That's what we need to address and fix because that's what contributes to this unsustainable spend in our country. So let's talk about two things, quality of care, and then we'll come back to the fragmentation. You have, many of you are experts in the area of defining quality outcomes that have published on these and your national figures in those areas. Others have spoken to you in the past as I heard from your president today. At Mayo, we break this down very simply to the value equation, quality, over cost, a ratio which is very difficult to wrap our heads around. But quality is patient safety, service, and outcomes. And we can measure that. And you are actively engaged at trying to improve the quality of the care that you have. Better safety, better outcomes, faster diagnoses, less side effects, less readmissions, all that stuff. The publicly reported parameters of that drive your hospitals and help you influence your physicians to try to improve the quality of your care. At Mayo Clinic, we use multiple different ways to improve our quality, as you do, Lean, Six Sigma, change management, PDSA, Baldridge, all the various techniques to do that. In the last six years, we've published 400 manuscripts about what we've done to improve the quality of care, and we've made some strides there. And I'm not here to, to boast about that, because many of, many of you are, are doing work such as that. But a simple story for those who aren't in this area might be helpful. We looked at something that you would all understand, blood transfusions. And we recognized that in our cardiovascular surgery practice, the surgeons were using blood transfusions differently. And they all knew how to do it, and they all thought they were doing it right. The surgeons got together and said, let's evaluate this, let's re-engineer how we do it, studied it very carefully, developed guidelines for how we would use blood in, the, in this cardiovascular surgery practice, and within a year had come up with an approach that was uh, adopted by everyone. Blood use fell 50%, and even more importantly, transfusion-related kidney disease fell by 40%. We shortened the hospital stay by a couple of days, and Mayo Clinic saved $15 million, $15 million over three years. That's the kind of thing that can happen. And you, you talk with a patient about that and say, well, don't the doctors know how to use blood? Well, I'll leave that to us, because much of what we've done in this profession, and I've been in it quite a long time, as many of you have, has been done based on, not on evidence, and not on consensus, and not on groups coming together. Physicians are fabulous at following if there's data. But if there's no data, they're not so fabulous at following it. We found that driving change at Mayo Clinic is best done with data and it's best done with teams that approach a problem. And our surgeons are marvelous at this. If you can get the surgeons all to come together with their nurses, technologists, appointment coordinators, the whole team looking at a problem as a team, put an engineer on the team, work through it. When we have an answer, they then adopt that change because they want to do what's right for their patients. I witnessed one of our thoracic surgeons talking to his group, and he said, look, the five of us, we're all very good at what we do. We all do it differently. At least four of us are doing it wrong. <laughs> I talk too much. He doesn't. Jim, to get to your point, boom. He got their attention. And someone raised their hand and said, actually, we probably all do it wrong. Let's try to do it right. So it's that, it's that commitment, again, to the patients. All physicians, I'm just speaking to, about physicians now, are committed to what's right for the patient, but you have to get them 
moving in the right direction. The numerator isn't such a problem. The profession is now addressing quality, safety, service much better than we did five, eight years ago, and you all have been part of that. But the denominator, the cost of care, has been a really tough nut to crack. And if you haven't thought about it, you can estimate the cost of the care or the spend of the care when a patient's with you in your hospital or in your group practice. But you don't know what happens to that patient when they leave. Did they fill their prescription? Well, my patients always did. No, it's not the way it goes. And so we, we've looked at this and tried to sort out, how do you get at the denominator, at the cost of care? Now, I have two shout outs from Massachusetts on this with great sincerity. A very, a recent, very, very recent one and then a pretty recent one. The very, very recent one is the work that's been led by Kaplan and Porter at Harvard. And perhaps you know about this, the time-driven activity-based costing method. And you're probably all doing that. I see some head nodding. Well, Mayo Clinic is a rapid adopter of great ideas. And we have taken this up and have just completed two projects and have one almost finished, which I'll briefly mention. But for those who don't know what TDABC is, essentially, as I understand it, and I'm not engaged actively in doing this in my current role, you identify a, condi a condition and say, what's the specific cost of this condition? Aortic valve replacement is one we're looking at. Knee and hip replacements. OK, those would be two. The third one we're looking at, which Dr. Kaplan has told me is something he's interested in because that hasn't happened yet uh, with their tool, and so we're working with them on this, is in primary care, the care transitions between physicians, if you will. Another uh, 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 opportunity for enormous uh, insights. You look at the complete care cycle for one of these conditions from beginning to end, and then look and see what happens in that workflow? Where, where was the patient from the beginning to the end, and how much time did they spend in each step of this value chain, if you will? And who spent the time with them? If it's an appointment coordinator or an orthopedic surgeon, the amount of time spent in each of the, with each of those people can be costed out per minute, if you will. And then you can get a sense of beginning to end. Now. It's quite common that we value highly, and appropriately perhaps, the surgical procedural costs. And they have generally helped with revenues to hospitals and so on. And we tend to devalue the things that are less expensive and less well reimbursed, such as time on a rehabilitation service. But as you probably know if you've read Dr. Kaplan and Porter's work, you can actually get a sense of where the value is in that. And it's not all in the operating theater. But there's opportunities all along that, that continuum to identify who should be doing what when, what technologies are being used, what equipment is being used, and how are you doing that. And I think it's a major breakthrough. So our team came out to uh, Harvard Business School, worked with Dr. Kaplan and Dr. Porter. They came, and we said, OK, let's do what, we'll do what you've done with surgical procedures, but we'll also take it into primary care which is an area that just has a tr tremendous opportunity, and we're very excited about that. This will allow us to say, where can, we, where can we improve the value? How do we get better outcomes, but also deal with the denominator, the cost? And we really haven't been able to do that before. That's the value piece. 